Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome. So, and thank you so much for joining us this evening, for taking time out of your, um, I'm sure, what is your busy schedule for, for being with us this evening uh, to talk about unionizing. And uh, we're really, really happy to have everyone here. Uh, just as uh, a heads up, we are as you might have heard me ask Lawrence to record this presentation, um, we are gonna be having this session be recorded um, and we'll be having it uh, posted to our website, uh, socialmission.org, which we'll share at during, uh, I guess, right after I'm done. We'll be sure to drop that link in the chat for anyone who is not familiar and would like to check it out. Um, my name is Rashmi Krishnasamy. I am a public health practitioner by background and I am an aspiring physician. I recently just got into medical school, so I'm hoping to uh, join the, the field very shortly. Uh, thank you. Thank you to everyone for your kudos. Um, I'm also a member of the Advocacy Advisory Council with the Social Mission Alliance, as well as a uh, co-lead with the Student Assembly, along with uh, my partner in crime, Robert Rock, and um, Isabel Chen as well. And I'm just gonna give a brief overview of social mission in general for, I know there's a couple of folks who are familiar with the work that we do. Um, there are some folks that are new, which we're really excited to have you here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of a rundown of what social mission is in general, um, go into a little bit of background on the Social Mission Alliance as an organization, as well as the Student Assembly, um, which is the entity that's hosting this uh, panel series, webinar series, starting off with this one. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Fiona Fimmel, who will be our moderator for the evening. So social mission is, um, the official definition is, uh, social mission of a health profession school is its, contribu its contribution and its missions, programs, and the performance of its graduates, faculty, and leadership in advancing health equity and addressing the health disparities of a society in which it exists. So essentially, we're really looking at how institutions are staying accountable to the communities within which they exist and uh, looking at whether they are contributing to the growth of those communities. Um, our organization overall is a, it's a national movement focused on health equity and training health professionals as agents of more equitable health care. Um, the movement started in 2012 with a conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma that brought national attention to medical schools with strong social mission commitment, created a forum for collaboration and shared innovations and legitimized the important role of health professions education in addressing social inequities. Over the past decade, our decade, our movement has expanded into include educators, practitioners, administrators, and students from many health professions, along with community leaders and policymakers for transforming health professions education. Um, this evening, our, our session is going to be hosted by um, Fiona Fimmel, who is a fourth year medical student at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Washington, D.C. She's originally from Chicago, uh, where she got her undergraduate degrees in economics and history. As a student, she got the chance to work with doctors who both were and were not represented by unions during the COVID-19 pandemic, which ignited an interest in labor economics and medicine. She's now doing research on trainee attitudes towards unionization in an effort to understand how they can best advocate for each other in the future. Thank you so much, Fiona, and to all of our panelists for being here. I will hand it off to you. And thank you so much, Rashmi. I'll open up by thanking all of you for coming tonight. And thank you again to our wonderful panelists for taking the time to be here with us. So to introduce them, I'll start with Kareem Sari Ahmed, who's a primary care physician and a researcher at Boston Medical Center. Um, his research is focused on the political economy of healthcare. He learned to organize from the Put People First Pennsylvania campaign in 2014. And he's been involved with other organizations related to like the Poor People's Campaign since. He was part of the group of residents that started organizing a union at Montefiore Medical Center in 2019, and that campaign is holding union elections earlier this year. Um, Dr. Monique, or Dr. Mo Hedman, is a family medicine physician who's practicing at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, and she's a regional vice president for the Committee of Interns and Residents, or the CIRSEIU. She's a founding board member of Arts and Minds Inc. and an advisory board member of Hip Hop Health Inc. or HHPH. Uh, Dr. Hedman received her BA in psychology from Emory, her master's in public health and certificate in pre-medical sciences from Columbia University and her MD from Oregon Health and Sciences University. After finishing residency, she'll begin a fellowship in geriatrics at Mass General Brigham. And then finally, uh, Danelle Corrin, who has been a registered nurse since 2004, is here too. She's worked in many different acute clinical areas, including emergency medicine, uh, med surge, ortho, oncology, and telemetry, IV and PIC team, and ambulatory surgery. 
So she's seen so many different parts of the hospital system. She's also a leader in her union, holding the chapter president position at Mount Nittany Medical Center. She's also an executive board member of SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania. And then most recently, Danelle has become the executive vice president of the Seven Mountains AFL-CIO CLC. So it's great to have all of these wonderful experts in healthcare and also people with so much experience in healthcare organizing. So I'm gonna give a brief, hopefully brief introduction to our discussion just to set the stage. So everybody, please feel free to jump in if you'd like to add something, this is not at all exhaustive. Um, so as we all are probably aware, 2022 was a year of labor strife. There was this global wave of labor activism in the face of external pressures from the pandemic and internal pressures from stagnating wages and this perceived lack of concern for worker safety. And medicine has not been exempt from that. We've all read terrible stories um, from the perspectives about providers who were left without adequate support during this global disaster. I went through medical school during this period and I know it left a huge impression on me and I was not even there every day. Um, as our panelists can attest, there's been a lot of new interest in labor organization and medicine right now, even among residents and physician doctors who've historically had a much lower rate of union participation. So I'll quickly speak to the history of unions among physicians and nurses because I really think it helps put the past year or so in more context. So most physicians who are in unions now are residents or trainee doctors. They've graduated medical school, but they haven't quite trained to the point where they can be considered independent. The first residency union was established in 1934 in New York City uh, and as a response to poor working conditions, low stipends, and lack of respect for educational support among resident physicians there. The further development of resident unions elsewhere in the country was hampered by a lot of institutional opposition. So antitrust laws, uh, large organizations like the American Medical Association campaigning against it. And then in 1976, the National Labor Relations Board, which is the government that decides who can legally constitute a union, ruled that resident physicians fell more under the category of students than employees. And as such, um, if they unionized, they would not be able to get government protections and support. In 1999, the National Labor Relations Board actually reversed that decision, which opened up legal unionization to all resident physicians who weren't already covered by state collective bargaining law. But since then, the very few statistics that are out there, and anyone who's done research in this field can attest to the frustrating lack of information, the statistics indicate that by numbers, union participation among physicians and particularly residents has barely moved. It's between 12 and 16%, and there haven't been any big movements since unions were made legal 20 years ago. The history of unions in nursing in the US formally started uh, with the American Nursing Association actually at about the same time in 1946 when they made a statement that called for collective action, both on traditional things like a 40 hour work week, better salaries and benefits, and then also some more profession specific matters like nurse participation and the administration of nursing services. And then since the mid 20th century, nursing unions have really proliferated and they've been able to leave permanent, consistent changes on their profession. Nursing has about a three times higher rate of union membership than any other private industry. So there's been a little research on the benefit of physician unions or exploring the kinds of labor organizations that have sprung up in the past century and how those can be used to inform labor organization in medicine. I'm just really happy to see that there's more interest and more research being done just in the last 12 months or so. Uh, I ran a survey study among my third and fourth year peers in medical school, and I found at least in my like N equals 500 sample that attitudes towards unions were really positive. People like them and wanna know more about them, but there's a lot of misconceptions about unions among medical students. So in the interest of hearing a little more about the perspectives of our wonderful panelists, uh, let's move on to some opening questions. So I would love for all of you to share a little bit about your journey in healthcare and what your first experience with labor organization and healthcare was. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Hedman? Hello everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, I am uh, PGY3 in family medicine at Harbor UCLA, which is a county hospital. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, like, I didn't know 
a whole lot about unions before I started residency. The only thing I did know, for whatever reason, I did know that I wanted to go to a program that was unionized because I just had kind of heard in the ethos that um, it would be a better situation. And that has definitely proven to be true. As a medical student, I've met uh, Dr. Lorenzo Gonzalez, who was currently the president of CIRSEIU. At the time, he was a third year resident in my program. And during one of our um, recruitment um, happy hours, he was actively trying to recruit residents to participate on a campaign um, uh, in support of a particular proposition here in California. And uh, besides everything else I loved about the program, I was like, okay, I like this. This is, this is the kind of uh, activity that, that I wanna be, be uh, involved with. Um, and then little did I know that I would start my intern here in the middle of a once in a lifetime pandemic. And um, you know, right as I was starting, um, you know, I, I started residency right smack in the middle of, you know, uh, LA, as you recall, LA County was in the news at the time uh, because of our surging numbers, because of our lack of PPE. Um, and soon after I began, I joined, um, I joined CIR in our fight for COVID impact pay, which involved us um, organizing a series of unity breaks, um, involved us you know, sending correspondence to the LA County Board of Supervisors, to our administration. Um, and that campaign lasted a few months and we ended up winning COVID impact pay, not just for the residents, but for all of the health employees of LA County. And it was that experience that made me realize the power of the unions and particularly made me understand and recognize the power of residents collectively. Um, and um, that led to our um, contract fight here in LA County where um, we came very close to going on strike. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I can just tell you that I, if you had told me that I was gonna have these kinds of experiences uh, as, as a resident, I wouldn't have believed you. But I've grown so much uh, as a doctor and as a human being uh, through my uh, leadership in the union. And uh, I'm very honored to um, have had this uh, role and, uh, and hope to play a role in propagating uh, unions throughout this country for residents. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'd love to hear more about the situation in California right now later on. Uh, why don't we hear from Danelle? Um, so I'm just going to kick it right off. Like she said, Danelle, I'm your nurse panelist. Um, nice to meet you all. So happy to be here. Um, so I actually started um, at my hospital directly after graduating from nursing school um, and remained in that hospital for my entire career, um, which is fairly unusual now. I've been at my facility for 20 years. Um, my actual start date was held back by one week because my hospital held um, a three-day strike in July of 2004. The reason that they collectively, 900 people, between eight and 900 people went on strike was because they were subject to significant and excessive mandatory overtime. So because of that strike, as a brand new baby nurse, I was never subject to being looked at and saying, you have to stay, you have to stay. And, and that very early on demonstrated to me the power of collective bargaining, collective action, and really truly organizing as a group for a greater cause that will ultimately protect patients and the staff caring for them. So we obviously we won mandatory overtime language. Um, and interestingly, um, that was a around that time that was a very big push in our state in Pennsylvania um, to, to get in placed into law. Um, as it turns out, our contract language was actually used to help mold the law that is now in place in Pennsylvania, which is Act 102. 
uh, and it went into place in, I believe, 2000, I think it was 2008. Um, so that was my start. That is absolutely amazing. Thank you. That's such a cool experience to come into just healthcare in general with. Thank Very you. much so. All right. And last but not least, how about Kareem? Hey, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, so uh, for me, it's sort of my first exposure to um, to labor organizing in general actually wasn't really in a, in a healthcare context. Um, and it kind of goes back to just um, when I first got involved uh, in organizing, and that was with the, the organization you mentioned, Fiona Put People First Pennsylvania. And we actually have some members and leaders from there, um, Nijmi and, um, and Harrison. So you can like DM them if you wanna know more <laughs> about, um, about the organization. Um, but PPF is focused on healthcare rights um, and I'm I'm still really close to that organization. Um, if you're not in Pennsylvania, it's more likely that you've heard of um, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Um, and PPF is one of the anchor organizations for the Poor People's Campaign in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, unions uh, have been present and I've been influenced by uh, both labor organizers and other kinds of organizers since 2014 when I first got involved with PPF. Um, and uh, I'm not sure whether this is still the case since I've moved out of PA. Um, but when I was active there, um, a rail workers union was like letting PPF meet in their space. And so like, there are a lot of like organic reasons for me to just be, um, exposed through those connections. Um, and there are also relationships uh, with PASNAP, so the, the Pennsylvania Association of, of Staff Nurses and Allied Professionals, um, a lot of really dope militant um, nurses and health workers that are part of that organization. Um, and there were individuals with membership both in the union and in the grassroots organization that I was a part of PPF. So that and also the co coordination of tactics with unions sort of between the community organization and various unions um, gave me kind of a really textured view early on of uh, the relationship between labor and, and people's organizations. Um, and so that was really key to how I view health worker um, unions in general. Um, so uh, my friend and I moved to New York for residency. Uh, and so my friend and co-resident who's also here, uh, Mark Shi, um, like happened to have really similar experiences as a, as a med student um, in Baltimore. Um, so in 2019, before the pandemic, we were talking, we were just in the same cohort of the same program, and we felt that like having just moved to a new place, like there was a whole universe of potential ways to sort of spend our political time, like spend our organizing efforts. And we both thought like, we're in a new place. And like, when you're a resident, you basically live in the hospital, like that's your community, like whether you like it or not. Um, and so we thought that um, building a resident union would be the form of organization which sort of made the best use of our position and would be kind of most impactful given who we were and, and where we were. Thank you. I love that. I like thinking of unions both as a protective force and as a component of the community. So to start things off from a more tangible perspective, I think it would be nice if you all could speak to um, ways that unions promote or protect the interests of nurses and doctors. And if you can think of any specific examples of that happening, you all have already offered some, but if you could just um, discuss some of the benefits that unions can bring to the people who are involved with them. And also the people who are in the industry, but not necessarily in a union. You all can just jump in if you have an idea. I can add one. <clears throat> um, so my name's Dan. I'm a, a, a new primary care provider uh, in um, a community healthcare clinic in Durham, North Carolina. And before um, I um, became a nurse practitioner, I worked as a, um, a nurse in the ER. And, and like Danelle, I can say I've been a nurse for 20 years. I've been waiting for 20 years to say that. Um, and I think 
one of the things that that I think people overlook when they think about collective bargaining um, and and better contracts and better working conditions um, is the principle of progressive discipline, which means that um, unlike places that are at will, um, where you can just kind of be fired and no questions asked, um, before any discipline is rendered, um, usually in a union situation, you'll have a representative to be there with you to walk through the allegations and figure out like, is this actually what happened? Is this not what happens? And um, depending on the results of that conversation or that process, that um, that warning may be uh, lifted or, or, or just investigated and found without merit. Um, and then beyond that, you know, then there would be usually like before you get to termination, you know, maybe it's a verbal warning, a written warning, and then suspension. Um, and then even if you're terminated through all that, then you still have the right to appeal your termination. Um, and that's usually with the legal counsel that the unions pro provide. And the reason that's so important is because um, it, it levels the playing field in terms of um, an employer not being able to selectively just get rid of people that they don't like for really what you worry about are, are the, the reasons that make you uncomfortable, sexual orientation, race, gender, um, politics. Um, and, and if you make people uncomfortable and they just decide that, you know, we got it, that guy's got to go. Um, it's much more difficult to do so um, in a unionized place. Um, and, and if you are wrongfully terminated at an at-will place, your, your options are not very good. Um, should you decide that you want to sue them for discrimination on whatever grounds, um, it's a very long path. It it interferes with your ability to get another job, and then when you ruffle the feathers like that, depending on who you're trying to get for a reference, it can create all kinds of issues for you. So, um, so I just kind of want to make sure that in the the bigger picture of um, whether it's legislative advocacy, community organizing pay, working condition, ratios, hour limits, uh, to not miss the fundamental piece um, that, you know, kind of levels the playing field a bit with progressive discipline. Absolutely, Daniel. Thank you. That is a great point and something that is often not discussed as much when we talk about the tangible benefits that unions can help provide. Danelle, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about what the nursing union has been able to do? Yeah, so, um, hang on, I just want to make sure I am in my notes here. Um, I, I really think that as far as like tangible things, the sky is really the limit. Um, when you look at, our room today a broader like you can unionize workforce it, it is known that like just to, statistically speaking that unionized workers are paid better have safer workplaces um where injuries and workplace hazards are minimized because of the 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 members advocacy um contracts can define you know very specific workplace processes and expectations I mean, and and that can be things that are very simple um, and like could seem very small in the in the grand scheme of things, but like and that could be like something like having a locker available for your belongings, but can also become bigger things like having specialized equipment to do your job effectively. Um, right. So yeah, that. I feel like those are the more tangible, like touchable, like things that we see our union doing. Absolutely. Uh, Mo, Kareem, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, um, well, first of all, you know, I want to just be clear about the fact that, um, you know, places that have unions, just including residency programs, just generally have higher wages and more benefits. And, um, you know, your, 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 the union, you know, negotiates legally binding contracts and anything that is negotiated with the employer 
um, is reinforced. And if they're in violation of anything, then you know it can be challenged through the union. Um, so, and I, I really do appreciate um, um, what Daniel said uh, because, uh, and this is particularly for um, you know residents are particularly vulnerable to to this sort of thing. I'll just give a quick um, statistic. There was an un unpublished study uh, by the ACGME uh, that showed that although um, black residents made up 5% of total residents, I believe in the year of 2015, they made up 20% of residents that were dismissed from their programs. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. And as you mentioned, any kind of like implicit or explicit bias uh, that could lead for someone to be targeted for dismissal, you have some protection, you have legal representation, you know, and you have uh, your union fighting for due process. Um, and so this is a very, very important protection. Um, and then, you know, another great thing that we have through the union is that we have means by which to uh, advocate for our patients. Um, you know, we've been able to negotiate patient care funds within our contracts that gives us extra money to purchase things that can improve uh, both the care that we're providing to our patients and our learning experience. Um, so those are just a few examples, but um, you know the, the, the possibilities um, of what the union can do for residents are pretty much endless. Thank you. Uh, aside from more tangible issues, um, what sort of political and social issues are unions using their political and social power to advocate for that you guys have seen? And I'll open that up to our panelists. I just wanted, wanted to uh, quickly speak to that. I'll just give an example, um, most immediate example. Uh, with uh, Roe versus Wade, we have established an abortion task force uh, through CIR to uh, ensure that our residents are able to, to, to advocate for residents being able to get abortion training, to advocate for um, you know, patients that are in states that have restrictive laws. Um, that's just one example of um, you know, what we've done to, uh, on the political side of things. Um, we have uh, here in Los Angeles, we have um, in California rather, we have the COPE board, which is the Committee on Political Education. Um, and that allows us to advocate for um, a number of, you know, we talk to our members and find out what's important to them. What, kind, what are our legislative priorities uh, that will make our jobs easier in, ter in terms of taking care of our patient populations. Um, and some of the things that we have um, proposed include increasing funding for um, you know, more residency positions in the state, uh, getting rid of the PTL or, or like limiting the post-training license to make it easier for um, um, people to get their full licensure. Um, those are just some examples. Um, but so not only are we doing things just at the level of our hospitals, um, but you know, we're talking directly to um, local state and uh, local and state um, and federal uh, officials uh, to, to make the necessary changes to our policies. Um, I think uh, and the one that comes to mind most for me, I mean, is kind of then uh, an overlap between kind of impacts on working conditions and sort of the broader like political situation. And that's actually not from the, um, from residents, that's from NISNA, so the, the nurses union um, at Montefiore, um, you know, they, um, and, you know, and throughout New York State, they've been fighting for, for safe staffing, meaning like a reasonable ratio of nurses to, to the patients that they care for, um, for uh, decades, depending on when and how you start counting. Um, and they, uh, through the, their recent strike, they won kind of like unprecedented uh, like mechanisms of enforcement for that. And so that that actually is about patient care. Like I think a lot of the the purpose and the the political like power behind the union is actually showing people like the politics that are kind of inherent in what they're already doing with their hands like day to day and how that has impacts beyond just the workplace. I think that the 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 challenge for unions and uh, 
And almost like the measure of a union is sort of your ability to sort of get people's immediate buy-in to the things that they see with their eyes and feel with their hands, to seeing that broader political picture, to understanding that like actually when you fight for something that's better for you, it is actually better for other people, i.e. the patients in the Bronx who instead of having a nurse that's like stressed out dealing with like six, seven, eight patients, they have a nurse that's maybe caring for just four um, or just five. And that... Um, you know, that's actually good for everyone. And like, that's politics. And I think that's sort of what, uh, and a, a strong union that can help politicize its members to see that broader picture and even see past the membership, right? See, see, see like people in the community as people to whom they're actually accountable. Um, that I think is, is what the, the most powerful and exciting thing about unions are for me. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you, for bringing up the idea that unions are a positive good, not only for workers, but also generally for patients as well. And that patient wellness is such a motivating force for organizing. Going back more into the granular details of it, this is intended for the uh, doctors, but Danelle will absolutely have opinions on this, I'm sure. Why do we think that nursing unions have been so much more robust and successful in the past than physician unions? Um, well, I'm sorry, Corinne, did you wanna go, did you wanna speak first? Um, I think there's a couple of different reasons for this. First of all, um, you know, resident unions have one unique challenge, which is turnover. You know, with other unions, you have people that have been working in the same position for many, many years, 10, 20, 30 years sometimes. Um, and oftentimes, you know, they stay in union leadership for that long. You know, we have, you know, we have people turning over every three to five years, um, essentially. And so sometimes it's difficult to build and maintain that kind of institutional knowledge. Um, and so that that's one challenge, but ultimately, I think part of it has to do with just um, the culture of medicine um, and just the idea that it's just a short time, it's a tough time, but you just do your time, keep your head down, you know, keep your nose clean and just get through it. And then, you know, you're to, for some like, you know, beautiful, happy time afterwards, which is, um, you know, really there is a, is a farce uh, because, you know, um, people have to be well, you know, you have to be well to do your job. And frankly, just to, to be real, not everyone makes it out, okay? Because this is, it's, it's a very, very, it challenges you. Uh, the experience of residency uh, weighs on you in ways that you can't even imagine until you're in, in it. Um, and just the way that it's structured, you know, it's structured in a way where individual residents don't have power um, and the hierarchy, you know, you depending on attendings, you depending, depending on superiors for letters of recommendation, uh, you know, to get future jobs. Like, it, you know, it's these kinds of things that make people afraid of being retaliated against um, and just afraid to take a stand because, you know, it could potentially affect their future career. And so um, those are just some examples of, of why it's been difficult to, um, you know, to, to to get more residents on board of the idea. But I think that some of these, some of these things are starting to be broken down and people are really starting to understand that collectively together, we are strong enough to advocate for ourselves. Thank you so much. I think that that is a Good point, both about the transiency of residency and then also a sort of culture among physicians in general. Um, out of curiosity, do resident or physician unions and nursing unions ever interact with one another? Like, is there any shared ground? Is there any way that you work together in certain areas? Um. I can just speak to this briefly, and I'd love to hear from uh, Danelle about this. Um, I can tell you that in LA County, we have successfully um, coordinated uh, some efforts uh, with the nursing union, uh, with the nursing union, um, not in this most recent uh, contract of 2022, but in the contract prior. Um, you know, the resident union and nurses union kind of um, joined, joined forces. 
uh, in negotiations with the county. And I think it ended up being quite successful. Um, you know, in this most recent contract year, we, you know, I, I attended a press conference with the nurses union in support of their impending strike, for example. Um, so there, there is um, collaboration, but I think that there could be more. I think that there's room for um, improvement in that respect. And I'd love to hear from Danelle uh, about that. So I was really interested to actually hear your response on this. My, uh, unfortunately, in my experience, I have not had exposure to resident physicians, advanced practice folks in unions. And I think that is so unfortunate um, and it needs to change. And I, I suspected that it was just how that culture um, has gone for so long um, was likely part of the reason that they they don't have as many unions. Um, I will say though, in my experience as a leader in my hospital, it was very interesting over the years to see physicians and residents come to me asking for advice um, to, to solve workplace issues that they were having. Um, and that type of back and forth discussion um, was really great and, and, and quite frankly welcome. Um, and they also showed tremendous support, most showed tremendous support um, you know, as we went through contract negotiations and really fought for improvements in the workplace, because to be honest, like if things aren't running smoothly from a nursing perspective, that is absolutely going to affect how the physicians are, are able to do their jobs as well. It's, it's, it's truly a like domino effect. If things aren't running smoothly, it's going to affect everybody on the care team. Uh, I'll just hop in. We, um, I, I would definitely echo that there's like a lot of room for improvement and in, in collaboration. I think across the board, it's probably safe to say that there's room, there's room for improvement uh, in collaboration amongst health workers in general, but uh, specifically between doctors and, and nurses and the organizations that they use to represent that you know we use to represent ourselves. Um, I think there were some really positive things that happened uh, at Montefiore around that. Um, I think um, part of it is that I think a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the residents on the organizing committee for um, the Montefiore House staff organization are folks who, you know, care about the kind of issues that we're talking about. Um, maybe there's some self-selection going on there, but folks like want to see the connections and they want like a healthcare like system that works for everyone and that, that and they, and they understand deeply that that like has to include uh, the leadership of, of nurses and, and everyone who is um, at the bedside. And um, so we've had like health forums together. We've, there's sort of like a shared group chat. There's, there's some like deep relationships being built, I think one-to-one, -one, but, um, and I think there's also some uh, luck and a little bit of like, you know, organizing hustles that, um, maybe help the beasts so that like this nursing strike is getting planned at the same time that the the union resident like campaign is is going on like folks recognize that and we're like let's work together like our enemy is the same you know um opponent uh, um and um that I think was really great and I think the strike specifically was such a great opportunity I think it was like that kind of politicizing, experience for residents that I think wouldn't have been possible otherwise, because literally kind of part of the anti-union propaganda that's coming from the hospital is like, oh, you guys are talking about all these social issues and staffing, and that's not going to happen. You can only negotiate your pay and your contract and your benefits. And then, you know, someone made a really great, great joke. And then, and then Nisna was like, hold my beer, you know, and like changed like, and, and like created like, a totally unprecedented like standard for safe staffing uh, in in the city. 
And so everyone is seeing that and having that experience. And that's thanks to that collaboration. But, you know, I want, I don't want it to be like one off. I want it to be like structural. I want it to be sort of embedded in the way we operate. And I think, and I want that to also be true for, um, for community organizations to not just be invited to speak at a big event, but to have community organizations that are guiding strategy um, and who are providing leadership because, you know, that problem of temporary workers, which is common to a lot of health workers, um, it's a, severe for residents, um, it can partially be solved by the continuity of community organizations. Absolutely. I think that speaks to the point that uh, Monique was making about the transiency of residency and how that can sometimes impair the accrual of institutional knowledge. Uh, for the recording, Isabel is giving some excellent background as to why there aren't a lot of physician unions in most states, which is that hospitals have a corporate practice of medicine law such that employees or physicians are not technically employees and as such, under the auspices of the National Labor Relations Board, would not be considered um, allowed to unionize and enjoy the protections of the government, which is of a piece of a lot of loopholes in the medical system. Uh, so going more into the mechanics of unions, what is the formal process for getting a union established and officially recognized? Like how much buy-in is needed? How long does it take? Uh, what is the process like? I can speak a little bit to that. I mean, it, those processes, depending upon the size of the group that you are trying to organize can be lengthy um and 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 difficult um you know one of the key principles of organizing starts with an issues conversation the best way you know when to organize folks to bring them into your movement is is really to stoke their issues and 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 fuel a bit of anger around that injustice right um and showing them what a union difference would look like um you know and that's where you know having good organizers and folks who can speak to that and and you know bring people in um is very important um as far as for the formatics of it really is um you're gonna have to have a majority vote um to get recognized you're i mean you can go in and ask for recognition and they likely will tell you no go pound sand uh <laughs> um but um then it moves to to an official vote um and at that point you need to have a good assessment of your folks um knowing who is you know in support of having a union um, and who is not it is important to know both sides of the fence um and you know hear out those people who are have concerns because their concerns are likely um because of anti-union rhetoric that has been spewed at them right um and and correct that if that is truly the case um you know and when you go to vote you should have a very good idea of how that will turn out and sometimes that can be very um tight i actually helped organize um the monitor techs who were not in the union it was sort of an they de developed into our hospital this role um uh monitor techs to be stationed in our uh, telemetry units as well as our emergency department to manage and watch monitors and do you know um alarm controls uh, so you know to diminish alarm fatigue um and that that vote was literally we won by two votes and i i vividly remember that and it was one of the first successes i had in organizing um and i sat and cried after that vote got read it was an incredible feeling to have been successful and know that those folks would have a voice at the table Um, I think that uh, a piece, uh, I think there are a lot of medical students, um, maybe, maybe hoops, I think some of so a lot of like uh, fourth years in particular. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the like force behind the Monty Union came from like interns who were like, I'm here to unionize this, this, this big ass hospital. Um, and, and 
So I think if you're one of those people, um, it's important to know whether you're the, the, the hospital where you're going for residency is public or private because the process is like is uh, quite different. It's just much easier to unionize um, in a public hospital because you just have to collect cards. A card is just, um, you know, basically it's a piece of paper with some legal language saying like, I want to be in this union represented by such and such. Um, and you need a simple majority like Danelle was saying. Uh, in the case of a private hospital like Monty, which is why this is such a, it was like such a grind and people have been trying to do it for decades and the conditions have allowed for it more recently. Um, you have to get those cards and win a majority and that wins you the right to have an election, a secret ballot election. So then you have to sort of like reach out to all those people who may have been barely willing to talk to you and get them to turn out um, to a vote, not uh, some, whether in person or to, to mail in their ballot. And that also has to be a simple majority only of people who are voting. Um, and so that's the phase that Monty folks are um, really hustling on now to turn out that vote. And it's, you know, it's a long time coming. So yeah, definitely uh, a, a huge amount of work. Absolutely. And all my respect to the people who are making it work and who have done all of this work for, I'm sure, decades at Monty. Um, I have a specific question for Monique because she she brought it up before, but can you tell me a little bit about working with the CIR SEIU and what's going on at UCLA, what's being actively petitioned from the admin? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm at Harbor UCLA, which is an LA County um, program. However, you know, we just, they just successfully launched the One UC campaign. And uh, all of the UC programs just recently um, successfully negotiated their contracts and had some really, really big wins. Like I think UCLA just negotiated um, like fertility benefits, for example, um, and then just like major gains in like housing and, and um, salaries and uh, other benefits. Um, you know, we, you know, we're just recently starting our legislative um, setting our legislative priorities for California um, right now through our COPE, uh, through our COPE board. Um, but, you know, in terms of like what things, you know, what things we're fighting for, it could be everything um, as mundane as, um, you know, cafeteria upgrades or, you know, in, improving, um, you know, electronic, you know, allowing like reimbursements to be electronic for those, for, for those are just some examples of just like very mundane things that can make the lives of residents better. Um, that all the way up to us successfully uh, negotiating due process for all residents, um, you know, who are, uh, you know, potentially uh, at risk of being terminated. Um, so uh, it, it really does run the gamut. Um, just like what are the day-to-day -day things that can make your life better as a resident? And then what are some of the big picture um, things that, um, you know, can affect residents' lives, you know, on a, on a much larger level? Just giving some examples. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting a little closer to 9 p.m. So I'd love to open the mic in case anybody in the audience has any questions. I know that there were some popping up in the chat. So feel free to voice them. Questions or thoughts, if anyone wants to jump in on a prior question. I have a question. Hi, I'm Stacy Davis. I'm a SMA fellow at this point. Everyone, thank you so much for your time and just the enlightenment that um, you are currently sharing. I feel like you guys have dropped a lot of gems. I have a lot of friends who are nurses and about to go into residency at this time. I'm sorry, I'm a D3 student at Howard University College of Dentistry. So I'm on the dental side, but it's always been very interesting. <laughs> um, but I am really am just interested in, for those who are about to become um, going into residency, what do you all feel is the number one thing to look for? Um, if they are trying to join a union? Um, like, is there some unions that are better than others? Or is there usually just one union at a um, hospital? So I'm just very curious on like, 
if people are interested in unions, what do you think are like the first steps to take in trying to join them? So I can answer a, a piece of that. Um, I think you have to look at the the unions that serve your area, um, not only your demographic area, but your area of expertise. Um, I'm a member of SEIU, which is you know an international union, but there is a subsection of SEIU that is um, SEIU Healthcare PA, which is the union that I serve um, under. So um, there is some. You really have to look at um, each union, look at their talk to their or their new organizing um, departments, and and gather the information that you need to make a educated decision to what union would best fit your needs um and and start working with them um i would i would also caution you to ask um a thoughtful question um if they do have staffing capacity to organize with you um if they don't have a new new organizing department or new organizing staff um that for me would be a red flag thank you um i guess that i had a small bit of experience trying to like make this judgment and make this assessment when we were first like yeah looking for um a parent union to help us i think i want to i say up front that like i think we I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think we need to have a, you know, a broad conception of what unions are and what they're for. And like, really, a union is a group of workers who like uh, organizes together for something that they believe in and agree on in a sort of democratic way. Um, for us, uh, we talked to the, um, I mean, I think CRR was the obvious choice because like they're the biggest and have like have so many resources. We also talked with one of the independent unions. So like you, the one at UW um i think they changed their name um has a long history and had, had has done a lot of really rad stuff and their leaders were really cool and it was really helpful to to talk with them about um kind of how how that choice was made historically and where it came from um and and i think that union actually has recently like voted to join cir um and in our case, I think yeah, the staff question was just really key. I mean, we spent like uh, a year and change organizing like kind of before and after the pandemic. And we had a lot of we had like a nice core of like really committed folks, but like residency is, is grueling and we just like could not make it happen without staff support um to really like hold us accountable to our numbers and, and do all of these kinds of things i don't think that's necessarily the case for every kind of healthcare worker but i think for residents like you absolutely need that kind of support we had amazing people we had amazing like you know worker leaders resident leaders but it, i think it would have been totally impossible to to really have a um a, a winning campaign in a private hospital uh, without strong uh, support from CAR staff who um, were and, and continue to be amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, obliquely speaking to another question that was in the chat about the pros and cons of uh, organizing with an uh, organization like the CIR, SEIU, or just organizing within the house staff themselves. Um, it's getting close to the final hour, so I'd like to finish up with a question. Uh, what issues do you think residents and nurses unions can and should partner with each other or continue to advocate for to advance healthcare in the future? What are your goals? I will take this one first because um... For over a decade, I have been stomping through Harrisburg in the Capitol building, giving speeches, lobbying, you, you name it, uh, talking to anyone that will hear me about safe um, patient limits um, so that nurses can provide safe and quality care. But, um, I think that is something collectively that physicians, residents, nurses um, can agree is essential because uh, it is our our duty to care and and heal. 
a whole person, not just pieces. I just want to say just overall, you know, we need to make sure that the people that provide care, particularly to the most vulnerable populations, we have to make sure that they are well. We are, if, you know, because you have people in residency right now are already thinking about how they do not want to practice medicine full time, or they're already thinking about how, what other career they're going to do other than practicing medicine. You've got nurses that are leaving the, leaving the field in droves. And as long as these things are true, if this continues in the way that it is, we are going to reach a real crisis. And I think everything that we're doing right now is to avoid deepening the crisis that we're already facing in terms of us not having enough uh, provider, healthcare providers to take care of vulnerable people. That is the goal. I, I would like to piggyback just a little bit on that if I can. Um, I also think that we need to address very specifically the concept of moral injury and stop calling burnout burnout. Um, we have been morally injured uh, and we and we've been morally injured by corporate health care um, and the situations that they have put us in. This is burnout absolutely points to a you problem. This is not an us problem. This is a, this is a, a, a systematic failure. Um, and we need to call that what it is and work together to to mend what they have clearly broken. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with all of that. I really agree with sort of the, the core um, piece of like um, of moral injury injury and mental health. Because to me, I think a lot of times, especially with, with doctors unions, people say like, oh, doctors have it, have it good. Like, why are you unionizing? Like, what are you complaining about? Um, but I think moral injury, like acknowledged or not, um, I think is actually the one of the really key uniting like, conditions of health workers and patients and like the rest of the working class, right? It sucks for everybody in that situation. Um, and so we need to sort of have like an organizing premise and, and principle that it creates a structure where all of the people who are affected by that can actually come together and, and think about what the root cause is. Um, because there are a lot of things that a hospital, a big hospital has the capacity to, to sort of do. Um, but you, at a certain point, you also come up against the fact that we kind of live in a society where like healthcare is a commodity. Um, and to sort of decommodify healthcare, to have like healthcare that is actually owned by people, that is run by the workers, that has the input of regular people, of working class people, of the poor, um, then we need to decommodify it. And that takes the social movement, which includes labor unions, but also includes organizations of the poor. Um, so yeah, I, I would just shout out to this organization called the, um, the Nonviolent Medicaid Army, which, which does that. It, it, it seeks to unite healthcare workers and people on Medicaid and people excluded from Medicaid um, under this banner um, to, to fight things like hospital closures. Um, and like to really like raise that as sort of the issue that folks can can really convene around to understand that like the thing that you're experiencing the reason you like the reason you like hate your fucking job a lot of the time is because um the system that we work in is is broken and the person who's on the other end of the care you're receiving is also having a really bad time but the health system isn't set up that 50 minute or however long patient encounter is not set up for you to come to that realization and so we need organizations that are designed to help people actually come to that realization because you can't you can't have it alone thank you i so agree and i think that everybody here can speak to having a moment where we realize that the commodification of what we're doing is big contributor to things like moral injury and things like decreased patient care and worse patient outcomes. Um, so thank you so much for um, coming tonight and lending us your experiences and your perspectives on labor organization and healthcare. I think it's a very interesting time. It has the potential to be a very exciting time. And I think that um, in the next few years, hopefully, hopefully not the next few decades, and we'll be able to see a lot of the work that people like you are doing come to fruition.
Um, so I'm going to open the floor back to Rashmi to see if uh, she has any closing remarks from the perspective of um, the institution of the Social Mission Alliance, who I cannot thank more for setting this up for us. Thank you so much, Fiona, and a uh, virtual applause to you for doing a fantastic job as our, being our moderator this evening and to all of our amazing, amazing panelists. Um, Kareem, no worries for cursing. This is a safe space. We're here to speak truth to power and shame the devil, as Robert loves to say. Um, and that's what we did tonight. And we're really, really pleased that we had such amazing energy um, from all of you participants and panelists. Um, I know folks are hopping off. So really quickly, um, we hosted this event through our social mission alliance, the Student Assembly. Um, the Student Assembly is a community that we are creating for learners across the trainee spectrum in, within medicine. So all across the health professions within medicine, not just limited to folks um, in the MD or DO space. We're really trying to reach other folks in the health professions as well. Um, this is the first of our uh, webinar series. Uh, we're going to be having another webinar focused on attrition. Talk about moral injury. Um, we'll be hosting another webinar on attrition next month on February 16th from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the month after that, we will be doing one. Um, I'm totally blanking on the one after that, but the one after that will be on hospital segregation. So April will be hospital segregation. Um, February will be attrition and oh, April, uh, March is gonna be actually DEI in uh, medicine and across the health professions. So we really hope that you will be able to join us for uh, at least one or all of those upcoming sessions. And this session, uh, just a reminder, is recorded and it will be on our Social Mission Alliance website. Um, you can find us at socialmission.org and Katie Webster, our comms lead, has been um, so gracefully dropping links as I'm speaking. So I'm hoping that you all can check that out on your way out as well. Thanks again for joining us this evening and hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>